Beautiful. We are recording. Mario, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you. It's a, it's been a while. It's always fun to work with you. Yeah. No. It, it, and it's a topic I am absolutely fascinated about. When you uh, when you emailed dropped me an email and said, "How do you fancy talking about this topic today?" I was like, one hundred percent. So I'm excited to see where it goes. And but I'll I'll start the show like I do every week, Mario. And that is, if you were at a intimate dinner party and you sat next to a complete stranger and they asked you what you did, what would you say? Oh, I would tell them that I am uh, working on uh, reversing aging and and uh, doing how centenarians live, people who are over a hundred, and but but healthy, healthy centenarians. So uh, the secret to anti aging is my uh, my work. And it, I I really feel that's a hot topic right now, especially for the last couple of years that we've we've actually gone through globally. Yes. and I think it really puts. Um, if, if there's one thing I, I hope that's come out of it is to really allow people to appreciate how valuable our health is and yes. that we can actually take steps to to really nurture that from our perspective, from an empowered perspective, you know. And I think it would make an amazing dinner conversation. There's no doubt, uh, especially if I was sitting next to you, which is, I guess, half the reason why the podcast is here today. But mm. why are you fascinated? Like, what what drew you into wanting to look at all these aspects, especially the way you do as well? Well, um, as, a, as a neuropsychologist, I, I learned biology and a reductionistic kind of thing where everything is genetics and you have genetic endowment and they even talk about the telomeres at the caps at the end of the, of the uh, chromosomes and so forth. So I started studying centenarians. I thought, well, if I want to know what works, I want to look at the evidence of what works and the evidence of what works in longevity, people who are over a hundred. And I only looked at the ones who were healthy all over the world. And then after a while, I found out that it's not genetics. Genetics is only 25%. And it's not the, it's not the diet. It's how they live is the way they perceive the world, which is what we're going to be talking about today. And uh, now with uh, the area of it's called epigenetics, which is not just what you're transferring in your genes, but what you're, gene expression is doing based on what you do with the world and the way that you live. It can affect your genes, but it can also affect how you transfer those genes. So for example, I have worked with people who are descendants of people who were in the in Auschwitz and the uh, concentration camps, and they pass on, the, the survivors pass on high level of cortisol for four or five generations, things that were learned in the environment. So it's epigenetic rather than just wow. genetic. And the beauty of that is it can be reversed. We can reverse that. And you can look at a chronological age. There's nothing you can do about a chronological age. That's it. You're, you're 40 today and 40, next year you're going to be 41. Your biological age is really what matters because that's the speed in which your, your cells age. And that can be reversed. Incredible. It's fascinating, isn't it? So I, I, I once heard the term... And because uh, I'd love to dive in the term epigenetics, because it sounds so complex when we hear it. We're like, oh, my God, <laughs> epigenetics, you know. And yes. uh, I've heard um, two. two uh, I, I had Bruce Lipton on the show last year and I heard him say oh, yes. uh, epigenetic, ep epigenetic meaning above the genes, I believe he said. And uh, yes, I've also heard epigenetic. Would, would that be a fair uh, uh, epigen and, uh, above uh, above genetics, and what it is is to to make it simple because people talk about. And Bruce Lipton is a a, a pioneer in that area. Um, he's a, a molecular biologist and a cell biologist. But what happens is that we have a we have a a, a DNA, and the DNA is the map that tells the genes how to express themselves. But it's not just that; the genes express themselves based on what the environment is 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 doing um, so if you're smoking uh, it's going to express itself in a way that the, eventually it'll create uh, cancer but that's that's the genetics that's your height you're not going to be able to change your height that's your the color of your eyes even that can change if you're a multiple personality but normally your your body type and all that is genetic but epigenetic means that something happens and i'll explain it in a minute at the uh, chromosome level that affects how the genes are going to be expressed. So the DNA says, okay, here's a map of the potential of how these genes are going to be expressed. And then the epigenetics is a part that says, okay, if you do this, it's going to be expressed this way. If you do that, it's going to be expressed in a different way. And it could be the external environment, 
what you eat, what where you live, and the internal environment, what you believe and what your culture te teaches you to believe. And the, the way that it happens at the chromosomes, there's something called uh, methyl. And the methyl is at, at the top, and that's what Bruce was talking about, the, at the top of the genes. And the methylation at, that happens at certain parts of the chromosomes will determine if the gene is going to be expressed or not. And there's some things that allow the genes to be expressed, and there's some things cap the genes to be expressed. So, for example, a family illness is just a potential to be expressed. It's not a genetic sentence, depending on what you do with your life. And that's the beauty and the, and the hope that as we know more about epigenetics, we can change how we're aging uh, in ourselves. So if you're, if you're 50 and your, your biological age is 30, you're 30. Doesn't matter how long you've been around, you're 30. Because your biological age is what determines how long you're going to be around. Yeah. So would it be fair to say then, Mario, that because I often think about epigenetics just in my Welsh simple filter when, when looking at these things, as that I could be susceptible to, say, type 2 diabetes, for, for instance, right? Yes. But I actually feel like I'm carrying a loaded gun but i never need to pull the trigger so it actually doesn't do anything because of the way i live my life from all those things you mentioned won't be then pulling the trigger for that gene to express itself yes that that's right because uh, <clears throat> and 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 some reductionist uh scientists and doctors will say look it's genetics you're your uncle had type 2 diabetes, your, your father had it, your, your brother had it. No, it's just an expression. But you see families live together. They eat the same thing. They think very much the same thing. They have the same environments. So they're collectively expressing or not expressing that particular gene. But you can the thing you can do is you can look, in addition to the things we're going to be talking about, is that you can look who doesn't have diabetes in your family. And you're going to find that that person is an, is an outlier. They do things differently. Right, and they they cap at the methyl, uh, methylation uh, level. They cap the expression of the genes that would uh, actually uh, activate uh, uh, the diabetes type two. Got it, got it. And let's say um, let's say somebody is fifty years old. They're just learning this information for the first time. Okay, and and I'm interested to see where your studies have reached so far. That we have maybe. Um, not been kind to us in lifestyle or unconsciously, you know, there's been different ways we've been living and especially include, and I keep raising the last two years, but it's been a very stressful period for many, many people, including myself at times. And sure. the, yeah. if we've been expressing the epigenetic gene and it has been expressing itself in a way that's not serving us, at what point or how much can we do about that to then re reverse if there, it has been damage than what have you found so far? In, in, in most cases, quite a bit. So for example, when I went to Poland, I'm a, I'm a consultant there. They said, okay, you do all so much work in uh, epigenetics and let's check out your chronological age and let's check out your biological age or your epigenetic age. And they were amazed that I'm 21 years younger than my chronological age. But let's say it's the opposite. Let's say you're 10 years older than your chronological age. You can still reverse that. You can reverse it because there's a lot of plasticity in the gene expression. Some things you can't. Some things are just damaged that you can't do very much about. But there are quite a few things that you can do to reverse not only the speed of the aging, but sometimes you can reverse some of the things that you've done by what you said in living a life of stress and so forth. And what I have found, and this is going to be, this is information that that you have now that will be completely new for Australia and the world. This is the first time that we're going to be able to see not just the supplements and, uh, and, and stem cell work, but we're going to see how, with a psychological uh, questionnaire that, that I developed, how close you are living to the four factors that I, that I identified with centenarians and how do we relate that to the biological markers. That's the first. We're doing that in Poland now. So if you take that test and it'll say, well, you're high on this factor and this, uh, this biological marker here needs to be uh, changed. So let's work on the factor. And what happens is later you see that the biological marker changes 
because it's a consciousness that you're changing. So, for example, just a very simple way. Let's say that you are, and, I, and I'll talk about this some more, but let's say that you are um, like centenarians. Gratitude is a very important component. But our cultures teach us not to be grateful in the sense of accepting our excellence. If I say, um, hey, guy, I like your glasses. You say, oh, they're old. I've, it's just, just, I've had them. Uh, my grandfather gave them to me. It's a, a devaluing of the gift. What does that do psychoneurologically? When you accept the gift and say, oh, thank you. I like my glasses too. You're secreting oxytocin and serotonin and endorphins, which are immune enhancers. If you, if you excuse yourself and, no, oh, these are old glasses, this a shaming, this an embarrassment causes some kind of uh, uh, some of the uh, stress hormones like uh, norepinephrine and so forth. So on a daily basis, you're giving an opportunity to enhance immunity or to deplete immunity based on how you deal with the world. And if you ask a centenarian, I said, I said to a centenarian, a, a woman's very beautiful, 102, and I said, you're really beautiful. And she said, oh, yes, I've always been beautiful. Ever since I was a little girl, I was beautiful. Oxytocin right there, as opposed, oh, no, I'm too old. You see, that's how you can create epigenetics. Wow. Do you, do you think, as a society, we've been fascinated in studying the negative effects of everything and not the positive? Oh, of course, of course. Even in, in my area of psychoneurology, the stress has been studied extensively extensively and everything is based on stress so what happens what i do in my books is you know what are the causes of health what are the causes of health the causes of health are inherited but you have to trigger them you have you inherit the causes of health because as homo sapiens we've been around for 150,000 years so it's trial and error trial and error the immune system says this works here this doesn't work so you have tremendous ability to trigger causes of health more than the causes of illness but you have to trigger them. They're there. It's an inheritance that's dormant until you trigger them. And also, yeah. I in the book, the, in the Mind, Body, uh, Self, the second book, I talk about how culture or how actually how uh, the um, longevity is culturally learned and the causes of health are inherited. This throws science upside down, but with, with good evidence that that's how it works. Centenarians don't have the, they, if they have good genetics, that's fine. But it's not sufficient to have good genetics. In fact, sometimes you have good genetics and you take it for granted and you live your life in a, in a not such a prudent way because you say, oh, I have good genetics. Well, it's not the genetics. Centenarians, I, I thought at first, well, it's got to be the, the telomeres, those little caps at the end of those chromosomes that determine how many times the cells are going to um, um, reproduce and so forth. Well, they used, they used to think, and some still do, but they're wrong, that if you have long telomeres, you're going to live long. Short telomeres, you're going to live sh uh, a short life. Centenarian has long uh, uh, telomeres or short uh, telomeres. Mm -hmm. And there is an enzyme, uh, telomerase, that actually can enhance the production of telomeres. And one of the things that brings that up is love. Love brings up the <laughs> the uh, that enzyme, uh, telomerase. <laughs> so... <laughs> So it's not a good indicator of, of, of longevity. There are other things like glycan and other things that are better indicators. Interesting, interesting. And is testing our biological age easy, easy to do? Is it accessible for everyone? Is it something that we could look at? Yes, yes. What, what they did with me, of course, they did uh, EKGs and uh, all the usual kinds of things, but then they did a specific blood work and saliva work, but mostly blood that looks at the glycan. And glycan is, is a major, major component of inflammation or anti-inflammation. If, if your glycan is low, <clears throat> excuse me, your glycan is low, then you're going to have a, a slower aging of your cells. If your glycan is high, and let's say they find that uh, your cortisol is high and, and other kinds like um, uh, the, um, uh, if you have an internal fat like uh, visceral fat, all those kind of things mm -hmm. will more or less determine, okay, this profile is the profile of a typical 50-year-old. Let's say you're 80. Well, your biological age is like a 50-year-old like a because of the correlation that's made. So it's very precise and, and very uh, able 
to have specifically what your biological age is. And then they have prescriptions, they have ways of dealing with it, not medication or anything like that, um, to teach you how to reverse it. But before they were blind to it, before they were saying, well, we'll give you this supplement or, or we're going to work with this anti-inflammatory. But now we can determine the psychological, the biocognitive way to reverse that based on what works, which is centenarians, with those four factors that I'll, that I'll mention here. Yeah. Well, what, um, what fascinates you the most when looking at reversing biological age? Because there's, there's so many aspects already you've mentioned that we could actually dive into right now. When I think about it, it's like, wow. You know, the part so that sometimes I, <laughs> I don't even believe my own theory sometimes because I know this can't be it. It can't be that easy. But, but it's really biosymbolic. It's a biosymbolic process. Why? Let's go back to anthropology. We didn't have 40,000 years. We didn't have language. And we had a very limited consciousness, if any. Anthropologists will tell you that we began to develop a consciousness when we, start, we started burying our dead and creating trinkets that had no tool value. You had tools, but you have a trinket, all of a sudden it doesn't have any tool value. You have tremendous consciousness you need to have and cognition to be able to abstract to do that. So that came. So before we had the senses, you could, you could smell a lion a uh, hundred meters away. Then language comes in and they tell you there's a lion a hundred meters away. So you begin to lose the epigenetic transfer of smell and you and then you replace it with words and then words become the same as your senses. Your brain has to learn the language and your immune system has to learn how to determine the language. So the brain is cultural and the immune system is cultural. So if I say to, to you now, guy, you're such a wonderful person, you're going to have endorphins and oxytocin because words become biosymbolic. If I say, guy, you're such an idiot, you're going to have molecules of inflammation, just like if you had a pathogen. And that's the most fascinating thing for me. Wow. You just, something really landed there. I'd never thought of it like that before, especially when you say we, it's culturally learned because we, we use words to replace the actual experience of what was happening yes. through other senses. Yes. That's maddening. So I, I, what does that do then if somebody is sitting at home watching the, the media every day? Because they, that's just a word, transfer of words right <laughs> yes and the brain doesn't know the difference cognition knows that it's not real but the brain responds as if it's actually happening there's some studies that show that when you get up in the morning if you go and the first thing you do is check your cell phone your cortisol level is going to be high for the rest of the day because it's putting you on alarm already it's getting you ready you're watching a rape while you're eating and you're going to have some problems with your digestion at some point because the brain can't tell the difference. It responds. Cognition knows, but cognition doesn't say, look, this is just a, uh, a game. This is not real. You respond that way. So if you, if you want to create gastrointestinal problems, just watch the news while you're eating. You'll, you'll have gastrointestinal problems. Wow. That's incredible, isn't it? And we're so unaware and we're so consumed by... Yeah. We're just bombarded, really, at the end of the day, you know, and we just... Constantly. And now what they, yeah, what they do is they, they say, okay, the only way I can get your attention is with your ego or with fear. If you don't buy this, you're not good enough. Or if you don't do this, something bad's going to happen to you. Either one is an alarm. So you're getting alarmed constantly to get things and to buy things and to be afraid of this and to be afraid of that. So we're living in a world of hyper alarm. Not because it's out there, but because uh, the, the system is set up to give you that kind of a, a perception. And centenarians don't buy into that. They don't function that way. Yeah. How then, what are our, our own thoughts doing to our, the words in our head? That if we, if we, if we caught Same up thing. in different emotions that, that, are, that don't thing. serve us. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah, because look, if we know that, that emotions and words and thoughts affect the psychoneurology, the, the thoughts affect the uh, uh, nervous, immune, and endocrine system, the way you're bombarding yourself 
is going to have a physiological response. So if you have learned shame as the, one of the, the uh, wounds of, uh, that I call archetypal wounds, shame, you're going to be having shameful thoughts and shame causes inflammation. I have worked with over 300 women who have a fibromyalgia. 99% of them have some kind of a shaming wound, either sexual abuse or physical abuse, something that allowed them to have a shaming consciousness that keeps going on beyond what happened to them during the trauma. Wow. So if you have constant immun immunological uh, secretion of uh, molecules of inflammation like uh, interleukin-6 and, and others, then there's, there's a lot of correlation between excessive inflammation and autoimmune illnesses. So fibromyalgia is one of the autoimmune illnesses. It's not totally autoimmune because it doesn't attack itself, but it's infl inflammatory kind of, it's an inflammatory kind of a, a disease, and it needs to be treated in a way that you understand that, that there's, a, there's a shaming component there. In your research then, how would you start to treat the shame? Because obviously it's, a, it's an unconscious loop that um, they might not even be aware of. It's just part of the way they are being. Yes, well, and, and that's right. They don't know they're doing that. They're just having those thoughts and having a bad day, but they don't know that they're getting immunological uh, problems there. Well, I, I talked about it in my books and I give explanations on how to do it, but what I found in looking at centenarians and other people, I, I look at cultures, as you know, all over the world, is that we can only be wounded three ways. Okay. Thankfully, <laughs> that's enough. <laughs> We can either, and the, and the cultures will wound you to keep you within the culture or to shame you or abandon you or betray you. You can only be abandoned, shamed, or betrayed. And each of them has a different kind of physiological reaction. So now the good news is that, that what I've been working on is that I have an antidote for each of them. The antidote for shame is honor, honor consciousness. And I use honor consciousness to teach patients anti-inflammatory consciousness. Because if a word can create uh, a, an inflammation, a word can create an anti-inflammatory reaction. And honor is an anti-inflammatory reaction that we're gonna begin to test in, in Poland. Clinically, I've seen it. I've seen changes in rheumatoid arthritis and fibromyalgia with, with the honor conscious techniques that I teach. So that's how you begin to do it. But you, you don't do it intellectually. You can say, okay, look, uh, it has to be at a level, at a contemplative level technique that I use so that you can turn off all the things that the brain does to, to distract you. If, if it were intellectual, I could say, hey, guy, you're doing cocaine. Don't do cocaine. It's going to kill you. Okay, I'll stop. doesn't work that way <laughs> because it's, it's a, it's a mind-body fabric that you created. So it has to go to a level that you uh, release the, the fabric and, and then begin to live that, that, uh, that consciousness. Yeah, amazing. How far then... Do you think we can take longevity? I mean, I've heard you speak about the average age used to be about 60, 65, I believe, going back X amount of years, and now we're kind of up to 80, yeah. 85. Well, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of people say, oh, we need to go back to the time of the cave uh, men and women. Well, in those days, the average uh, uh, lifespan was uh, 35. So you don't want to go back there. We're built to be at least 150. Wow. But, uh, but and, and the longest that we know, living has been 125, 126, something like that. And, um, but I think what we do is we, we sabotage our longevity by the way that we live and also by the way that the conventional science tells you that you have to live, uh, that you're going to live uh, this long. Well, that's it. And, and, and here's the key. What I call the uh, cultural portals is very important. One of the cultural portals is, is what the culture will tell you need to be. The middle age portal is extremely important. There's no such thing as middle age in, in biology. The, the centenarians, will, you ask them and say, that's a dumb question. You find out when you die. There's no such thing as middle age. <laughs> but the culture will say, let's say that 45 is middle age. All right, 44, you were okay. But 45, you can't wear anything else that's not middle age related. And you can't think out of middle age portal because if you say, well, I'm 45, but I want to go back to school and, and go to law school, 
immediately, look, you got to start saving for your retirement because you're going to need to eventually go to a nursing home. I'm not exaggerating. I mean, that's how. So eventually they put you into the portal of uh, the middle age. You begin to look middle age, you dress middle age, you feel middle age, and you have the illnesses of the middle age. Mm. Bioculturally ingrained and admonished. It's like the world's gone mad. That's what it feels like. The um... Well, I said, we don't know any better. We've done this because we didn't know that the science could tell us that that's not the way to go. Yeah. Uh, we know now from functional MRIs and the epigenetics, and we know what happens when you think and when you do things in a particular way. So the immune system has a sense of morals, has a sense of not self-righteous, but, but in a way that, uh, that it, for example, I always want to give examples so you can Please. see the, the evidence. There are some studies that look at, at children who may be just a few, a few weeks old, and they show them a video of toys fighting each other, and they show them a video of toys cooperating with each other. Consistently, they look more at the ones that are cooperating than the ones that are fighting. That's what Hoffman called the precursors of empathy. We have that. They'll cry if they hear another baby cry. And what they did is they thought it must be imitation. Let's let's play. Let's record the cry. They don't cry. This has to be real. So we're we're predisposed for goodness, and our culture will set us up in a way that could be good or it could be bad. But we're very malleable. It's, that's the good news. Yeah, that's important. It can be changed at any age. That's another thing. That, 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 you can change it at any age. Yeah. It doesn't have to be. Yeah. Sorry, Mario. Yeah, that was going to be my next question about. Because it, it it'd be quite easy to go. Oh well, I'm I'm 65 now. It's or 70, and and um, it's too late for me, you know. But I, I believe as well with yeah. with centenarians, so I, I usually, uh, they they have a they have a point where that that's not even in their in their radar. Like the present moment is never too late. No. So I'll talk about one of the factors to answer your question. One of the factors is what I call time consciousness. That's one of the four factors. The way they perceive time, they elongate time. So one that I asked, I always use this example because it, it just floored me. He had a, a small um, vegetable garden. He was 101. And I said, so what do you think of your vegetable garden? It looks pretty good. I said, yeah, but wait till you see it in three years. <laughs> 101. So that kind of consciousness, it, it, it expands. It creates a time-space projection that allows you to live longer because you're not worried about how long you're going to live. The other thing about it is that gerontologists will tell you that as you grow older, because of the brain, they have all kinds of dumb ideas, uh, that you're going to, the time is going to really go faster as you grow older. And it's true. But the reason that it's go faster, not because you're going older, but because your curiosity went down. Curi what they call the first 30... Uh, up to 30, you have your first everything, your first love, your first divorce, your first everything, graduation, whatever. After that, you don't have that many first. And the brain pays a lot of attention to the first. And when it pays a lot of attention to something, it elongates the perception of time. Centenarians, over 30, they continue to stay in novelty learning. Mm. And they don't have that problem with the time passing fast for them. So it's curiosity not the brain deteriorating. Amazing. With centenarians, it just triggered a thought because one of the biggest challenges I see for people, Mario here and in the work we do, putting out here in Australia, I'm in front of people all the time, so I get to see firsthand, um, is one of the biggest problems is that people go, I can never find my tribe. I'm the only one that wants to learn this or do this. And I always feel like I'm getting pulled back in to an environment that's not supporting somebody that wants to change, that wants to move forward. So with, say, the centenarians, are they more in an environment that is supporting those cultural beliefs that are allowing them to live healthy over 100? Or are they outliers even in there and we have to become an outlier and to, to be the change that we want to see in others? You know what I'm saying? You have to become an outlier. They're all outliers. They get support from people because they they they, they astonish everybody. But some of them uh, 
live the way they want to live. It's not like uh, you shouldn't be doing this, you shouldn't be there. Live the way. So they, they, they're they all outliers. They go, and what happens in, in science, look how arrogant <clears throat> conventional science is. The outliers are the ones who, uh, if you have a family illness and everybody dies at 50, you're still ar around at 80. And when they look at studies, that's considered a nuisance variable because it's out of the norm and they don't they don't look into it in clinical trials or anything. It's a nuisance variable. And the outliers at, at the end of the curves, that's where you get the real information, not in the groups, not in the not in the average. Yeah. So it, it all works against, but yeah, to answer your question, they're all outliers. Wow. They uh they and some of them come from really bad places. They come from concentration camps, some of them have been raped, uh, they've had many adversity in their, in their lives. And one of the things that they don't do, they don't die with the people that they love who died. And they don't get sick with unrequited love. They have two, uh, two, two things that are really important that could actually, sometimes you see it with uh, celebrities, the, uh, the wife or the husband or the, or the partner dies within six months, the other one's dead. They're not like that at all. And the secret is that if you don't want to die, with people that you love and you don't want to get sick with unrequited love. When somebody says, I don't want you anymore. Then what you do is that you mourn the dead by celebrating, having known them. That's how you mourn them. You celebrate having known them. It has a different psychoneurimmunology. And when my mother passed away, that's what I did. I took my son and my daughter out to dinner to celebrate having known her. And that's how we dealt with it. You're sad, sad with a celebration rather than sad with a morbidness yeah. unrequited love somebody leaves you they don't want you anymore the way to come out and not get sick and a lot of people get sick is by having complete faith in your journey and thanking the person for having the good sense to say no to you <laughs> because you have something better coming up wow but you see the brain and the heart have a different code the brain the brain says why would I want to be with somebody who doesn't want to be with me? Why would I want to be with somebody who hurt me? Well, that's the brain. The, co the, the code of the brain is reason in a terrain of logic. The code of the heart is emotions in a terrain of unconditional love. So the, the, the heart needs time to catch up with the brain, and you have to teach it to catch up with the brain by giving it faith in your journey. And that begins to then change the process. You don't get sick. Amazing. Do you then feel, because you mentioned the word faith, that's really struck me because like I've got to a point in my life where I just, I, I do surrender a lot and have complete faith in, in my journey and, and trust. And it allows, it feels like it takes a lot of pressure off, but there's um, spiritual practices behind that, Mario. Like, is that been a common denominator in your research as well, that actually believing something beyond the physical self? That's a great question. Most centenarians are spiritual. They're not necessarily religious, but they're spiritual. They have some belief that there's something greater than themselves. But for example, let's say that God doesn't exist, and this is it. If you believe that God exists and there's something beyond, immunologically it's better for you because you're not living that you're going to be food for the worms. But if you want to be food for the worms and continue to live a good life, that's fine. I know a lot of people who are atheists and who believe in nothing, and they're very compassionate. But you have to have some kind of phenomenology that says, this is what my life is. You have to determine what your phenomenology is, whether it's food for the worms or angels waiting for you. It doesn't matter. But you have to determine that. Now, what they call Pascal's uh, wager, Pascal said, whether God exists or not, it's better to believe in God. <laughs> and immunologically, what it, it's like, for example, when people say the universe has my back, that's nonsense. The universe is expanding. It doesn't care if you want a new car or a new relationship. But if you believe that the universe has your back, that belief is what helps you, not the universe. Yeah, yeah, which is good enough in my book anyway. You know, if, if you believe it to be true, then then that's, that's yeah, that's right. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. <laughs> what is what is your hopes? Because I know you 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 we we actually spoke about it more often than on there that you you know you're currently working um, with Pol uh, a company in Poland was a company or a university in Poland with the longevity. 
Yes, it's a center, it's a longevity center. Longevity center. It's called the Longevity Center in, in Warsaw. It's really excellent. What What is your um, hope well, for the work that you're doing long-term with this? To refine that questionnaire that, that I developed, so we can, because we're going to do it, for example, since culture is so important in determining your reality, we're going to be testing it in Germany and, and Poland and the United States to so see the differences in the cultures, but we'll still be able to pick up the four factors. So, for example, one of the questions that you ask, and you have to be careful how you ask it, because if not, it's, it's biased. In some places, in, in some cultures more than others, you can't just say, do you believe that you're intelligent? Because it'll have a social uh, social undesirability, and you'll say, no, I'm not. So you, you have to ask the question, do you believe that your friends think you're bright? Okay, yeah, I can, I can do that. So you disown it <laughs> in order to get the real wow. information. If you don't, then they'll say no, because you're taught to not accept your excellence. Yeah, got it. So that's my, my goal is to really refine that to a point where we can actually say, okay, if you're low in this factor, what we're going to do is this and this and this and bring that factor up and you're going to see the biological markers changing. And then that means that you can reverse age at any time, which we we're doing already at the center. I mean, with the, uh, the CEO uh, was able to change uh, and reverse her age, uh, their biological age, eight years. Um, and, and I'm work mine's 21, but I'm going to work on 30 and see how it goes. See if, uh, if I can bring it back to 30. <laughs> so, and, and never, ever tell your age. If you tell your age, you're, you're being in, put in a box and your fabric is made up in a way that when you're told, oh, you're, so you're 80, immediately all of that comes back and you become 80. So when people ask me, what's, my, what's your age? Now I can tell them, well, my chronological age is 21 years older than my biological age. So what's your chron what's your biological? Uh, Twenty one years younger. That's it. Beautiful. And people will say, so do you have a problem with your age? No, you have a problem with wanting to know my age. I'm ageless. I, I'm not interested in my age. I'm interested in what I've done with my life. Why celebrate a, a, a birthday? Celebrate what you've done in your life. And that is powerful, powerful information. I think that that your audience can take, and let other people get upset. Give them permission to not like it. You're going to live longer than the ones who are worried about the age. I, I love it, Mario. I love it. Yeah, you know, uh, the one thing that's screaming at me right now is empowerment. Like you said, it, it really feels like we've been conditioned to look outside ourselves. And can you can you please fix me? I have this issue. I just need to. And 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 a lot of this work feels to be about taking our power back and really being strong in our own in our own identity. Yes. Very much. And I'll, and I'll talk about that. I'm glad you brought that up because, for example, agency, we don't talk much of, about agency in, in psychology. You do very much in, in philosophy and anthropology, but agency is the action, the, the action that you have to take a choice. It's, this is my choice. That's, that's my action. That's agency. Fate is something that happens to you. It's raining or you fell or something. That's fate. Agency can come in and can shape agency, or actually it can take, agency can take fate and turn it into destiny. So you can change your fate into destiny with agency. So that's the empowerment. But if you say, well, this is how it is, then your fate becomes your, your destiny. But if you take agency, which is empowerment, okay, I can change it. And this is how centenarians are. They, they're in a constant, I talked to one who was in a concentration camp in a, a, during the Soviet Union and uh, he was from Estonia, and I asked him, so how, how was it over there? How was the experience? They're not Pollyanna. They don't tell you, oh, it was wonderful. They tell you it was terrible. It was terrible. But the funniest thing about it, look, at, is when I got home, my mother said, why didn't you write me? I said, mother, they didn't let me write in the concentration camp, and he started laughing. <laughs> that's, that's what, that, that was his take. Wow. Yeah. So uh, it's very important that you that you begin to see things at what the humanity of things. Um, so uh, yeah, that uh, agency is extremely important. And what is empowerment? I'll define empowerment. Nobody does. When I work with Fortune 100 companies, I explain that in their how they do their mission statement. Empowerment simply is 
access to resources to overcome a challenge from an immunological cell to a job. Access to resources to overcome a challenge. If you don't have access to resources to overcome a challenge or you don't take the resources, that is helplessness. And the immune system responds to helplessness by pulling back. Helplessness begins to pull back. Instead of make it stronger, it pulls back on the natural killer cells and, uh, and, and the uh, anti-inflammatories because it goes helpless. So the immune system, to a certain degree, responds to the consciousness that you present to it. Got it. Got it. Just um, move it. Yeah. So it's very important. Yeah. Just moving the, the, the episode, I'm aware of the time, Mario, and I, and I want to ask you, how do you bring this work into your personal life? Do you, do you have uh, like a morning routine? Do you have certain rituals? Is there anything that jumps out that you think would be helpful for the listeners for you that you do? Yes. Uh, I try to live like centenarians. One thing that they are not, they're not rigid. If they're vegetarians and they're invited to a to a barbie <laughs> and to eat meat, they'll eat the meat. Uh, but they don't eat it, for, and they don't do it out of fear. They do it out of joy and taste. That's the first thing that I do. The other thing is that motivation is overrated. Motivation is, is a manipulation for, to get you to do something you normally wouldn't do. So motivation is worthless for me. This morning, I got up at 5.30, and I go swimming. I do laps. And motivation is, is a worthless thing. So I said, what is the archetype that I need to take on now? the Spartan archetype. I get up and I do it. I don't think about it. The moment you start bringing thoughts and motivations and ideas, you're done. So the archetype of the Spartan. If you're a woman, the archetype of Athena. Archetypes of power. So I got up, I did it, I went swimming, did my, my laps, came home. That's it. But rituals are very important to keep you um, going. All of centenarians have rituals. I went to Cuba to study some centenarians a few years ago, and I asked, at the time, I didn't know that the rituals were that important. So I asked this 101 woman, so I didn't say rituals, so I didn't want to bias. I said, what do you do that you do on a regular basis that it has a value for you, and it gives you a sense of identifying with yourself and your culture? Immediately, she said, oh, I have a shot of rum before I go to sleep. So I thought, it's got to be the Cuban rum. So then next day, I interview another one, and I, same thing, and he said, I have a cigar as soon as I wake up in the morning. So I said, oh, the Cuban rum and the Cuban cigar, till finally I realized that it's the ritual that gives the immunological power, the ritual. But they never abuse rituals. I asked them, well, how many shots of rum do you have? Or just one. Why? That's all I want. They never abuse the rituals. So that's, and that's what I do. And then I eat well, and uh, I, I use some supplements. For example, in the, in the epigenetic thing that they did, they found that I have a propensity to have a deficiency in vitamin D. So I take vitamin D3, that's it. If you have a deficiency for selenium, you eat a Brazil nut every day and that's it. So one thing that you have to do, you have to stay active. You have to stay active. You can't be sitting around and meditating. That's nice, but you have to walk or swim. You have to do something to keep you active and to keep that immunological process going. So that's very important. And the other thing about it is that you have to be able to let yourself go of any kind of hatred that you have. They know how to forgive. They don't forgive because they're wonderful. They forgive because they don't let anybody keep them in, in their prison of nostalgia like the Greeks did. Yeah. So, you, and, and there's a technique that I teach. I have one chapter about forgiving. All centenarians are very, very good at, at forgiving. People will say, there's some cultures will say, I don't forgive and I don't forget. Well, you're going to have some immunological problems because you you have the resentment there. So really, forgiveness is, is an act of self-love to liberate yourself from a predator. That's it. But it can't be done intellectually. It has to be done with yeah. methods. Beyond the mind. Wow, that's massive. Massive. I um, yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting. You, I laugh because my, my good friend, Marcus Pierce, who I've had on the podcast, I, I believe he's interviewed you as well, Mario. He's been fascinated about the Blue Zones for many years and, and looked at that. And he and he had always go to say to me, yeah, but, you know, the centenarians, you never see them going to the gym lifting weights. You know, they're always they, – but they, they move a lot, you know. And um, I, I, do want, I do wonder about these things. Yeah. 
They walk, walk a lot. They yeah. walk a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Fine. yeah. Yeah, you don't have to do weights, but but what you do is make sure that you do some activity mm. that you like. If you don't like the activity, don't do it because you'll, you'll sabotage it and you won't get the value because you'll be resenting it, which is a bad psychoneurological response. I like swimming and I like walking and I like weights, but I do only the ones that I like. I don't do the ones that I don't like. So it has joy has to be the component across everything that you do. Yeah, that's massive. I love it. I love the idea of embodying archetypes as well, because I kind of do a morphed version of that in my own mind and my own yes. way when making decisions. And do you do you list those archetypes or do you dive into them a bit more in your books around that? Uh, yes, yes, I do. The archetypes are things that we and it's more than the Jungian archetype. An archetype is a very functional thing that, for example, again, 150,000 years of, uh, of trial and error. It's like tools in a context. The archetype for a father or a man and a boy is father, not lover or anything else. So we know from that 150,000 years that a father is the archetype for the son. And what do we do sometimes? We become the professor of the child or we become the lover of the child with uh, with sexual abuse and so forth. And it's just like taking a hammer and trying to hammer something that uh, that requires a, uh, a screwdriver, a screwdriver for the screw and a hammer for the nail. Once you're out of those archetypes, you have psychoneurological deficiencies and problems because you were made to have the, what happens when you have incest? Well, biologically, you have all kinds of problems. You have retarded children and all kinds of things. So it's, if, you, if you take the, the back of a screwdriver and you use it as a hammer, it'll break. It wasn't made for a hammer. So the archetypes are really important. So you have father, mother, you have teacher, healer, mystic, uh, warrior, and you have to have them in the, in, in the context where they function. So I'll give you an example. When I was working for a neuropsychiatric hospital, I didn't shift those archetypes and I wasn't feeling well and I would get home and I would continue to be the doctor with my kids and they didn't need that. They needed my father or their father. So what I did is I thought, okay, when I leave the hospital, I'm going to get in my car and I'm going to have a, a sensory signal. So I'm going to turn on the car and when I hear the sound of the engine, that is my cue that I have to move from, from doctor to father. And it took me 30 minutes to get home. So I was practicing fatherhood for 30 minutes. When I got home, I was father. Things changed uh, because that's what they needed. And, and that's a very important thing. You want to be aware of what archetype you're using. And with, with executives, what they do is they have a visionary archetype and they take it everywhere and it doesn't work. Steve Jobs, my one of my uh, heroes, he couldn't get out of the visionary archetype. And even on his deathbed, he said, I, I should have learned, I, he didn't say archetypes, I should have learned how to deal with my family, not like an executive, but like a father and a husband and that kind of thing. And, and, and I think, and, and if you can burn out, you can, he was in the visionary 24 seven, you couldn't do that, he burned out. And then he has a propensity for cancer and the crazy diets that he was doing and that kind of thing. Well, yeah, gone. Wow. That's powerful. Thank you for sharing that, Mario. That really uh, hits home for sure. I believe um, I believe you, you, we spoke off as well. You've got a, a seven-week course coming out. Uh, is that soon uh, to help people with their the biological age? Is that correct? Yes, it'll be coming out um, at the uh, yes, it'll be a, at the end of uh, of March, I believe, and it'll be through uh, Shift um, a Network, which is really good. And they're going to have seven seven weeks, and uh, it'll be one and a half hours each week. And there'll be techniques and there'll be um, many, many things that you learn. And it's basically about how you can learn um, longevity culturally and how you can trigger Amazing. the causes of health. Amazing. Well, for everyone listening, I'll make sure there's links in the show notes below if they want to if they want to jump on and check that out for sure. So if you're watching this on YouTube or listening on iTunes, there'll be there'll be a link below as well uh, for, for your websites and everything, Mario. Um, I, I always ask one question wrapping up the show, Mario, and that is um, with everything we've covered today, is there anything you'd like to leave the listeners to ponder on? Uh, 
Yes, to get out of the helplessness of the reductionist science that says you're genetic and, and begin to see yourself as a biocultural being that was shaped by a culture and take the best of your culture and drop the worst of your culture and begin to live your life being aware of what kind of archetypes you're using in what context. And usually we overuse an archetype that works best for us, but it works best only in one context. If you take it somewhere else, it doesn't work as well. So that awareness alone would be worth everything that we talked Amazing. about today. Mario, thank you so much for coming back on the show. Um, thank you for all the work you do. And it's so My important, pleasure. the work that you're doing. And I, I really feel there's a hunger right now um, for, for us to be all learning and leaning into this work and actually starting to empower ourselves and take our power back and, and, and live, live from that place and live from the heart with full of gratitude as well. So Very much. And, uh, and thank you for the work you do and the success yeah. that you're having. That's wonderful. Thank you. Cheers, well Mario. Well deserved.